Hi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are going to get started in just a couple of minutes. In the meantime, um, Sarah Lomont has shared some links to her new upcoming book um, on endangered eating. Um, so I invite you to please explore those links um, and possibly purchase the book. I, she is going to be coming back to um, talk about that book in September. And that's going to be on September 19th at 7 p.m. So we're really excited for that. Um, and uh, these are special pre-sale links. So please click on those if you're interested. Hi again. Thank you for joining us. If you're just joining us, um, we are going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, I have a couple of program announcements to make before we start, and I will do those in just a couple minutes. In the meantime, um, Sarah has shared our presenter tonight. Uh, Sarah Lohman has shared some links in the chat. And uh, please feel free to click on those links. Uh, to learn about her latest book that's coming out in September. And we will be having a special event, a special virtual event with Sarah in September um, about the book. And uh, those links should, should help you to pre-order the book, which would be wonderful. All right, um, so we're just about, I don't wanna take any time away from Sarah tonight. So I'm just gonna get started with some um, announcements of upcoming programs. First of all, tomorrow night on Wednesday, May 24th, uh, we welcome back um, Bruce Magnuson Bruce Magnuson is going to talk about a Greek odyssey, Athens, Delphi, Crete, and a Fulbright Fellow, um, which is the Fulbright Fellow is his own daughter. Um, so he's going to talk about Greece, and that's going to be at Wednesday, on Wednesday, May 24th at 7 p.m. On Thursday, please don't forget to join us for our one book author, Charlotte McConaughey. Um, she's going to be online um, chatting with uh, Ashland Public Library's director, Mina Jane, um, and that's going to be live online at 7 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, we will be recording, so register to be able to receive the link. On Tuesday, May 30th, starting at 6.30 p.m., we have a virtual program called um, Compelling Questions is a series that our library puts on. And the uh, title is, what does climate change mean for Massachusetts plants and animals? Um, so please register to receive the link that starts at 6.30 on Tuesday, May 30th. And of course, uh, Sarah will join us once again um, in June on Tuesday, June 27th, uh, for food photography or food porn. 
um, a history of images in cooking, which sounds super fun and is a great companion to this one tonight. I do want to make sure that everyone knows that um, Sarah's book launch, um, she is going to come and do a virtual program for her around her book launch, her next book launch, um, on Tuesday, September 19th, uh, and that's going to be at 7 p.m., and we're really excited to be part of that, and hopefully we can get some copies of her book to give away. Um, but tonight, uh, we are... Tonight is a really fun one too. Um, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. History of cookbooks. Um, tonight, Sarah Lohman, if you have not joined us before for any of these programs, Sarah Lohman is a culinary historian and the author of the best-selling book, Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine. I have some coworkers who have read it. They love it. She focuses on history of food as a way to access the stories of diverse Americans. Her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and NPR. She is presented across the country from the Smithsonian Museum of American History in Washington, D.C., to the culinary historians of, the Southern, of Southern Carolina, California. Her current project, Endangered Eating, explores America's Vanishing Cuisine will be released in by with W.W. Norton in 2023. So we hope you will join us for that event in September. Um, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the history of cookbooks and recipes. We'll trace the uh, evolution of cookbooks over 1,000 years from the first written recipes, the cuneiform tablets, to visceral delights of eating in the ancient Muslim world, to the legacy of Black cookbook writers in America. This is amazing, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is always my pleasure. I'm so excited to be back. Um, thank you for talking about my new book. I am really pumped about it, and I can't wait to talk to you about it in uh, in September. It comes out October 24th. Uh, but today we're going to talk about a talk that I should warn you when I first put it together, it was two hours long. So we're not going to get to everything in that original talk. We're going to keep it a little shorter and sweeter tonight, but we're going to really focus on what I think are some of the most significant cookbooks in all of history. And a lot of firsts, I think most importantly as well. Let me get my presentation up here beginning with, this is actually a snapshot of some of my own collection. Um, a big part of uh, what I do is, you know, access these historical recipes to understand oftentimes the evolution of a particular recipe or an ingredient. So you might see a few classics up there. Maybe you'll recognize the bindings for some from some cookbooks you have in your own home, or maybe we're in your parents' or your grandparents' home. Um, yeah, Jessica, I've got a lot. My oldest original is from 1825. I was lucky enough to find that at a library book sale in Vermont last summer. I was looking through some vintage cookbooks and one of the librarians came over and said, do you like old cookbooks? And I was like, yeah. And she walks away and she came back and put this book in my hands. It was $40. So it's a lot of collections about a lot of different topics. Even on this page, you can see everything from the Settlement Cookbook, which is a, a classic cookbook from the Midwest that started as a tool to educate librarians. It can be dangerous that way. She got my money, Jess. She really did. Oh, uh, food porn will be next month. Uh, and I, I bet Jess can put the um, uh, the link into the chat for us for the next presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and we're gonna talk about Henry Lowe's book, which is the first, one of the first Chinese American cookbooks, Pao Wow Chow, an amazing um, indigenous cookbook that I found at Savers. It's a, a sort of a local chain of thrift stores to the Victory Cookbook, a special binding from the 1940s of the American Women's Cookbook that has sort of um, ration friendly recipes in the back. You even have some dieting cookbooks like the Fat Boy Book, which is sort of over here behind this mushroom. Um, I Most of my oldest ones are reprints. My newer ones are of course originals and I do have a shelf full of contemporary cookbooks which we'll talk about as well. So all that to be said, we're not gonna get to every single book that may be your favorite and most important. But what I really love about this talk is talking about how recipes have evolved. 
So especially from some of these older books, we are going to read a couple of the recipes as well. And talking about the presentation next month, it is a great partner to this talk because today we're going to focus on the words, the text, and how recipes have evolved. And then next month, we're going to talk about how imagery has evolved with food as well. Okay, so these cuneiform tablets are 5,000 years old. Cuneiform was the first written language. The spoken language is actually Akkadian. They come from Iraq. Um, there are about two dozen different recipes, I don't know, closer to 35 different recipes, and these are the first known written recipes in existence. A lot of our very early food knowledge comes from what today we might call the Middle East or the Fertile Crescent or more broadly the Muslim world, and we'll talk about why a little bit later on. This is really pre-Muslim culture. Um, but there's still amazing food in here. And a lot of these recipes are thought to be um, temple offerings. Oh yes, just thank you. If anyone does have questions along the way, please feel free to stick them in the chat. I do have my chat open and you know I don't mind stopping and having a little talk in the middle. So um, these are temple offerings uh, for both meat and vegetarian dishes that would have sort of been offered to their, their favorite foods of different gods. And they're just the oldest known food recipes anywhere in the world. So not all the recipes are complete because there are broken and damaged passages, even though we do understand the written language. Um, the ones that are complete are mostly ingredient lists. There are a few cooking instructions. Um, here, here's one, for example, this is for a pigeon stew. Split the pigeon in half, add other meat. Prepare the water, add fat and salt to taste. Breadcrumbs, onion, samidu. No one's quite sure what that is. They think it might be semolina flour. Leeks and garlic. First soak the, soak the herbs in milk. When it is cooked, it is ready to serve. A very sparse recipe by modern standards for sure. The add other meat part really gets me. Just, I guess, any other meat you want or is laying around. Or more likely, there is probably some known way to prepare this recipe that's unfamiliar to us today. But I do love that last line, when it is cooked, it is ready to serve. You know, that's it. You're making a stew, serve it hot. It's good to go. So these are some of the earliest recipes around. Um, one of the, the earliest handwritten cookbook that we know of is called De Re Coconaria, which translates to On the Subject of Cooking in Latin. Um, and it's from Rome in the first century AD. So we've already got a split of about 3,000 years between the cuneiform tablets and this one. Have I heard of Parsi cuisine? You know, I have. I do believe, Rita, that there is a new cookbook out about Parsi cuisine. Um, I would have to do a quick Google for that, but maybe, maybe it'll come up. But someone just wrote about it recently, but that was my first exposure to it. Um, but please, if you, please, if you know more about it, please share in the chat. I think sure all of us would like to know more. Um, Dibber Coconaria, uh, so a lot of these early cookbooks, these really handwritten cookbooks are written by men for men. Uh, they're for professional cooks. And although women ironically did the, the bulk of the domestic labor and cooking at home, if you were cooking professionally in this era in the house of a wealthy person, you were male. That was considered inappropriate for women at this time. And of course, because it was a man's job, it had a higher status than just regular old women's cooking. To be fair though, a lot of these early cookbooks, including, including Diver Coconaria, were banquet foods. So they are really, really fancy foods. Um, this cookbook in particular from Rome contains some of the first, uh, well actually, let me just read you a recipe. It'll give you an idea of some of the ingredients that appear in this book. So this is for a kid or lamb stew. So a baby goat or a baby sheep. Put this, the pieces of meat, oh, this isn't in the original Latin. You've probably noticed that. Put the pieces of meat into a pan, finely chop an onion and coriander, pound pepper, lovage, cumin, garum, oil, and wine. Cook, turn out into a shallow pan, thicken with wheat starch. If you take lamb, you should add the contents of the mortar while the meat is still raw. If kid, add it while it's cooking. 
garum is a fish sauce um, that it was developed in Rome. Uh, and it is extremely similar to the fish sauces that still come out of Southeast Asia today. It's basically a fermented, pungent, super savory, super salty sauce that was used as both a cooking ingredient and as a garnish as well. So uh, uh, some spices, actually most of the ones that are in this are herbs or the seeds of herbs. Um, it, even though there were imported spices available via the Silk Road at this point, um, this cookbook doesn't uh, rely on a lot of them, but still a really well-seasoned, complex, savory, um, odorous, fragrant dish too. Now, I mentioned the Muslim world as well, and at almost the same time as Dibra Kopanaria, we also have a handwritten manuscript that comes out of Baghdad in the first century. It is simply known as Baghdad Cookery. And again, this is a cookbook that was written for very wealthy people, written for caliphs, which are sort of a ruling religious class as well. Um, and this book is, okay, so Christianity, Catholicism, they had issues with uh, overindulgence, uh, although certainly some people ignore those, those rules, but of course, gluttony is a mortal sin, right? So there was much more a, a free culture of loving and indulging and experimenting in food. Thank you, Rita. Rita just popped a, a link into the, uh, probably the cookbook I'm talking about, yeah, um, in the chat. Um, so Baghdad cookery is, again, for a wealthy class, uh, but the food is really rich and fun. Um, there were more cookbooks written in Arabic and Farsi before 1400 than the rest of the world's languages put together. So it is a huge food-based culture, but again, these are largely cookbooks written by men for men for very, very opulent banquets within um, royal or religious courts. Um, these are largely communal dishes. Most of the ones in these early eras are, you have a communal dish, and in, in the case of Baghdad cooker, you'd be eating from the communal dish as opposed to be served, served on individual plates, um, but everything was served sort of banquet style. Um, mm -mm -mm. So I actually have made a couple dishes from this cookbook. The photos aren't good because this was quite a while ago that I experimented with this. Um, on the left, uh, both these are chicken dishes. This is sort of a lemon and toasted walnut dish with fresh cilantro or coriander that is wrapped in a toasted flatbread. And the prep dish on the right is was actually my favorite. You put the rat, the um, flatbread in the bottom of a roasting pan, and then you put apricots in there, and you make a sauce with um, rose water, and then you put the chicken on a rack over top of that, and then roast the chicken. So then you, it's almost in a way like a Yorkshire pudding. You get this like really doughy sort of concoction at the bottom that is then seasoned with the juice from, oh, thank you, Jess, um, that is seasoned with the juice and the roasting chicken as well. We did have a little banquet that night. So the first known cookbook written in English is the form of curry. Curry comes from an old French word for cooking. Um, it is English, it is from the 14th century. There are um, about a dozen different vellum scrolls or bound books. Um, and each contains about 200 recipes. These are all copies of the original manuscript. And it does vary a little bit because it is copied and things were deleted or things were added to. Uh, there are a couple ex uh, copies of this within America. One of them is at the Morgan Library in New York City. I did get to see it in person once. Um, and this will come up again next month as I'm talking about imagery because you know I'm showing you this original cookbook. So we haven't seen any images yet. Um, and this is more of a very, an illuminated manuscript, but a very, very, very simple one too. I've made a couple dishes from this cookbook as well. Um, and you can see them on the right. Uh, there is a pork loin in a um, really rich wine sauce with leeks. It is seasoned both with things like black pepper, but also cinnamon and coriander. There's also an apple mash that is colored with saffron. That was a big thing in Muslim cooking too, um, giving things different colors with natural dyes, sprinkling sugar over things um, to make them sparkle. So you do see that quite a bit in medieval uh, royalty. We're talking like lords and very, very rich people banquet cooking as well. Um, this cookbook was originally written as the chief master cooks of Richard II. 
about the right time period, but difficult to confirm. It was written in Middle English, but uh, Middle English is, it's more that the spelling wasn't standardized in English. So you can sort of read it out loud and understand what the recipe says. Um, it is the first English book to mention cloves, olive oil, mace, which is part of the nutmeg fruit and different gourds. There was, uh, even though this predates first contact with the Americas, there were Asian gourds that were used in British cooking. Um, nutmeg, caraway, ginger pepper, and cardamom are all included as well, including uh, some unusual animals too. There are recipes to prepare whale, crane, curlew, heron, seal, and porpoise. Why? England is a Catholic nation at this time. There are very strict fasting laws in early Catholicism, not just a meat, no meat on Fridays and no meat on Lent kind of thing. There were hundreds of fast days throughout the year where you couldn't eat meat. Um, for rich people, the church, though, said that any animal that spends enough time in the water can be considered fish. So that's why something like a heron or a seal is considered as fish. There is sort of a fermenti with porpoise, which is a wheat and milk gruel drink mixed with slivers of porpoise. But I'm going to read to you a recipe called Sauce Madame. I'm going to read it to you in modern English, too. But there are, are images of this book online as well as transcriptions that you want to check it out. Sauce Madame. Take sage, parsley, hyssop, and savory, quinces and pears, garlic and grapes, and stuff the geese therewith. Again, that always cracks me up because I never saw the geese coming, but what an interesting combination of stuffing of sweet uh, fruits along with garlic and lots of fresh herbs too. So the whole that no grease come out and roast them well and keep the dripping that falleth thereof. Take meat, jelly, and dripping and add in a posset. When the geese be roasted enough, take and smite, cut them to pieces, and that that is within, and add in a posset, and put therein wine if it be too thick. Add thereto powder of galangal, powder deuce, that was sort of a pre-mixed kitchen spice, like think like emeralds, like bam seasoning, and salt, and boil the sauce, and dress the geese in dishes, and lay the sauce onward. Uh, in one of these other early cookbooks, I mean, I love the language. You can already see these recipes are not formatted like recipes today. They're pieces of prose. Um, but one early recipe I read for a very early pumpkin pie said to be sprinkle the top with sugar. And I do love the term to be sprinkle something. So these are from a bound copy as opposed to a Bella manuscript. Um, and yeah, the language isn't easy to read, but you kind of get into a vibe and uh, it becomes easier to both read and understand. At almost the same time, uh, this is a enormous cookie manuscript from uh, the Mongol Empire called Yin Shan Zhang Yao. And the Mongols, of course, were known for their military might, but they also sought to impress and intimidate in other ways. They had this very large empire that encompassed, I know I love these sprinkle, that encompassed many, many different cultures. And so after conquering, they would invite sort of the principals, the lords and leaders, um, as well as people outside of their empire, ambassadors, to sort of the, the Mongol stronghold. And one of their ways to impress them was not just the quantity and quality of food, but they would often prepare foods from the visiting guests' own culture. And so they also were able to show off how sort of culturally savvy and knowledgeable and intelligent they were, as well as um, having military power as well. So uh, there is a lot of classic Chinese food in here. There is a lot of sort of Muslim and Persian food in here as well. Um, this is basically a cooking guide to uh, document not only really elite Mongol dishes, but sort of a guide to how to cook for these visiting ambassadors. Um, to give you an example, here's a recipe for mastic soup. Mastic is a tree sap that has a very specific smell and flavor that I don't think I'd be able to describe, but maybe some of you have had the chance to try natural mastic at some point. Um, so it's made from mutton. It has cardamom, cinnamon, chickpeas. You boil ingredients together to make a soup, strain the broth, cut up the meat and put aside. Add two more ounces of cooked chickpeas, a pint of rice, and an ounce of mastic. Adjust flavors with salt, salt to taste. Add the meat and garnish with cilantro. A lot of the recipes have this, um, this very sort of Near East 
combination of um, almost like a harissa, like a cinnamon, black pepper. It will include cardamoms as well. I know I'm missing another spice in there. Interesting, there's also um, instructions on how to distill alcohol uh, using the word arak, which arak is a, a word that is still used to this day for particular types of palm liqueurs that are made in Southeast Asia. Um, no, it's another spice, but give me one second and I'm gonna look really quick in my notes. Do, 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 do. Exotic recipes, dazzling. There it is, cinnamon, cumin, black pepper. So that's like the really typical spice blend of the Near East. Um, but then also you find a lot of uh, spicing that's very reminiscent of China, including the cardamoms and also long pepper as well. And this book is illustrated, which I think is very cool because it also includes stories and it's also about balancing humors as well. So it's um, food for a very long time throughout Europe and Asia was very much connected to your health and prescriptions. You know, you maybe have heard the the contemporary for his food is medicine. Um, uh, alchemists would basically prescribe diet to balance your humors. Are you too hot and choleric? You need to have foods that balance that. And so this book also talks uh, about those, those same concepts as well, as well, as well as providing beautiful illustrations and moral tales as well. 1475, so over a century later, we have De Onesta Voluptate e Velitudine which is also from Rome. It should also not surprise you that a lot of our cookbooks come from Italy and a lot of our cookbooks come from Persia and the connected Arabian Peninsula. These have been food centers of the world for a very, very long time. This is the first printed cookbook. It is printed in 1475. You know, Jess probably knows this offhand, but I don't remember when the first Gutenberg Bible came out. I'm curious now to see how long from printing religion to printing food we get. This book is written by a man named Bartolomeo Sacchi. Um, interestingly, he, uh, upon his death, did not consider this among his great works, but it, it ends up being the only book, book that anyone now 500 years later really remembers him for. It, it documents the recipes of professional cook Maestro Martini de Rossi, 1440. So that's not that long, 35 years, and we're printing food books as well. And that's what makes this book so popular because it is printed. It has a much further reach than any of the written manuscripts up until this point, which had to be copied and copied and copied again. This too, though, is, is very, very fancy banquet food by men, for men, that kind of thing, for male cooks. Um, Maestro de Rossi was a very famous court cook in Rome. And um, although some of the recipes are a little bit more low key, I guess it could be um, called, he also includes a dish where the cooked meat of a peacock is put back inside the skin and feathers and the whole bird is then, bird is then put on the table to look as if it were alive. Um, the bird, um, so this was, ends up being a really common tactic like through the Baroque and Renaissance of presenting um, this whole, this roast fancy bird that still looks fancy. Um, but the maestro adds another level to it in that he recommends if you want the peacock to blow fire from the beak, you may put cotton and camphor soaked in aqua vitae or wine in the mouth of the bird and light it on fire. So not only is the peacock coming to the table whole, but the peacock is coming to the table breathing fire. Um, it's interesting too, because Platna, you could also see what he really thought of food, where no one is quite sure why he decided to write this book, he, uh, probably because he could make some money, but he seemed to have a very um, headbutting relationship with the maestro because after one of the maestro's recipes, Platna added his own comment, when it is cooked, serve it to your enemies, there is nothing good in it which is like, I mean, such a burn. Damn, Platina. Okay, we go back into Asia again. This is the first cooking manuscript to come out of India. Again, it's a combo combination of recipes, but also medicinal thing. But the uh, Nimatanama literally translates to the Book of Delights and includes recipes. I, I really want to get into this one. I've not found an English translation of it yet because there are 500 year old recipes for dishes that are still a big part of um, transcontinent, continental Indian food today, like 
samosas, uh, rati, dal, lassi, and then also uh, Indian Persian dishes that we still find uh, coming out of places like Bangladesh and Pakistan, like shorba, kebabs, and biryani. So I really want to see, um, oh, interesting. I really want to see what these original recipes look like. Oh, and also halvas, but not halva, how you might know it as like a sesame paste. Um, halva is the Farsi word that just means sweet. So there's a melon halva and a ginger halva in this as well. So I really want to try this one out someday. Some more, it is also illustrated. And so you can see images. It actually looks like there's samosas on the plate there, as well as flatbread. You can see the mortar and pestle. Um, honestly, it's making me kind of hungry just looking at it. Even the plants are usually medicinal or flavorful plants as well. So this is one of the earliest cookbooks written by a woman in 1670. There were one or two that came out of um, Europe before this, um, but this one is certainly fascinating because it comes out of Korea. Um, the name translates to understanding the taste of food. And you know we've been talking about men and professional cooks. This was a cook written by a mother for her sons so that her daughters-in-law would know how to prepare their favorite recipes. So can you imagine, I'm sure there are some people out there who are married and their husbands, you know, oh, nothing is, good, is as good as my mother's. This isn't just like my mother's, my grandmother's, right? Well, she wanted to make sure, Lady Jang Yi Hang wanted to make sure that her sons never had to pine for her cooking. So although there were several copies of this made, they were passed down through families for uh, about 400 years. Um, until they ended up in the hands of, gosh, at this point, I believe it was a 10th or 11th generation. This was in the early 2000s, maybe even more. Um, and basically this woman, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking up her name right now. I'm sorry, I don't think it's in my notes. Um, basically a, a woman got married to one of Lady Jiang's descendants and the husband said, here, this book's been passed out in my family for hundreds of years. And she looked at this and she realized she couldn't even read the Korean because it was an older style of Korean. And this is also highly unusual because in 17th century Korea, women, even noble women, weren't educated to read and write. Basically, she eavesdropped on the lessons of her brothers and taught herself to read and write. And that's how she was able to document her recipes. In 2006, um, the, the woman who married into this family ended up collaborating with a professor at a college who was an expert both in old Korean cooking and old Korean language, and they published a modern Korean version of this in 2006. There is actually a restaurant in Korea that makes dishes exclusively from this cookbook. Um, here is a chicken dish with potatoes. There's also um, pickles involved too, pickled scallions and eggs. There are actually over... Um, there's 146 dishes and 30 pages, and there are several dozen pickle recipes. Um, this is most of them. You can see mushrooms, greens, radishes. Uh, there's looks like chicken in the middle. It looks like sprouts. I'm sure I, from what I read, everyone is different and delicious. There also does not seem to yet be an English translation of this book, but this is certainly another one that I would love to get my hands on. So from this point forward, we're largely going to focus on American cooking history. Great. Halfway through. <laughs> it's the perfect place. And um, in the 18th century is when we begin to see a switch from professional cooks writing for other professional cooks, men to men, um, to women writing to other women. And that originally starts with manuscripts that are passed down through families. Now, this is because um, more women are uh, able to access education and are literate, but still uh, earlier on, these were for very wealthy households. And it really is until the 19th century that it's more middle-class families who will pass down food manuscripts like this. Um, the one that you're actually looking at here on the left, um, this is a, a manuscript that belonged to Martha Washington. She did not write the recipes. This was a gift from her husband's family on the occasion of her first marriage, a man named Daniel Custis. Washington was her second husband. Um, so Martha Custis received this book whose recipes span um, from the late Middle Ages to the early modern era of the 18th century. 
the manuscript was basically recopied whole every time it was passed to a new generation. Um, it's known as Martha Washington's cookbook, but again, it's not really her recipes. And there are two volumes. One has savory recipes, and you can just see it here. It says to make confits. Confits are little candy colored, usually uh, candy covered spices. Um, so this is the sweet edition of it. And on the right hand side, this is the Lefferts manuscript, which is from uh, in the collections of the New York Historical Society, dates to the very early 19th century. And although the Lefferts family were a uh, Dutch family that emigrated to Brooklyn, at this point, they'd been in the country a couple hundred years, but their cookbook is still filled with traditional Dutch recipes like Oli Cokes, which are donuts, crullers, also donuts. I mean, they're just really good with sweet things. Um, yeah, a lot. I've made some pretty delicious recipes out of that book. Oh, and here's a recipe for New Year's cakes. Uh, this is, for, again, from the Lefferts manuscript. This was a Dutch tradition that you'd go visiting on New Year's Day. There would always be lots of food, but you wouldn't let your neighbors leave without giving them a New Year's cake that was often stamped with a intricate design. You can see how many neighbors Lefferts might come by because um, it starts with 12 pounds of flour and 10 of sugar. And it also includes caraway seed in orange peel, which is a really, really delicious combination, unexpectedly so. By the late 18th century, we also begin to see published cookbooks as well. The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy was published in Britain in the 18th century by quote unquote, a lady. We know now that the book was written by Hannah Glass, but in general, it wasn't considered appropriate for women to be publishing and writing and doing anything public. So a lot of early women might uh, write anonymously. This is a British cookbook, but it really was the first one that the earliest British colonists would have brought with them to America. And it was eventually updated with a, an American appendix using American ingredients like pumpkin and corn as well. Um, in the middle, this is the first cookbook both published and written in America, American Cookery by Amelia Simmons, published in 1796. So pretty late in the colonization of America. Um, for anything before that, we have to rely on oral histories uh, we have to, or we have to rely on written manuscripts. And on the right, it's just a cookbook I really like. I do believe this is Sarah Hale, or I think it's actually Lydia Child's book. Both are from the 1830s, but I grabbed this page because um, you can see that recipes are still prose. And there's been this long connection with food and medicine. And so you can see the kind of, the recipe for beer is also advice. Beer is a good family drink. This is small beer, so this is like, fresh fermented kind of under 1%, more like a, a soda in a way. A handful of hops to a pailful of water and a half pint of molasses makes good hop beer. Spruce mixed with hops is pleasanter than hops alone. Boxberry, fever bush, sweet fern and horseradish make a good and healthy diet drink. The winter evergreen or rheumatism weed thrown in is very beneficial to humors. So in the 1830s, we're still talking about the um, Old, much older medicinal idea of balancing our whole humors to have good health. So these were recipe books for women, but also advice books and also very casual because the idea was they were written for women that already knew how to cook or brew or bake. And these books are just giving them new ideas of different recipes they can make. Well, uh, American cookery is the first cookbook written and published in America, it was published out of Boston. The Virginia Housewife is another very early one and quite significant and um, influential. Um, it really is, this is an 1839 edition. The original one comes from 1824. Um, it's significant in that it documents a style of cooking that I feel like most Americans, even themselves, don't believe that it uh, existed. Um, in that there's a lot of spicy food, it uses chili pods too. Um, I, and of course it's a very American book too, in that it's full of cornmeal, it's full of oysters, it's full of pumpkins. I just pulled this page because I liked the word waffles, rice waffles, W-O-F-F-L-E-S. Sort of a note on the transition from largely men writing cookbooks, largely women writing cookbooks. This did create some fighting on the pages. 
Um, there is a shift too in popular culture where now it's starting in the 19th and late 18th century, households are largely staffed by women as opposed to men. You'll have butlers and things like that, but as far as the cooking staff, that kitchen is now filled with women with a head cook. But because now it's considered women's work to get hired to work in a, in a wealthy household, the work is not as considered as prestigious and women tend to not only make less money, but get less credit. They're not necessarily the ones publishing banquet cookbooks. A lot of these early cookbooks, they emphasize frugality and how to feed a family rather than how to make a um, peacock that breathes fire, right? Um, and women would criticize the male cookbooks and say, um, that they were put these ridiculous recipes in that had no thought for frugality. Um, and that she wrote that they cook for epicures and the gluttons rich enough to pay while the female cooks were satisfied that the food was healthy, tasty, and did not cost a mint of money. On the flip side, um, there were French and Italian cooks that were saying, you know, stay out of professional publishing, professional cooking. This is man's work, although women's work is the, is, you know, in the home, you doing this is usurping our line of work. So there was still very much this divide between professional cooks and restaurants and women who were home cooks as well. In the 19th century, we also see some of the first cookbooks written by Black Americans. The House Servants Directory by Robert Roberts is the very first in 1827. At this point, when he writes this book, he is running the household of a congressman. Um, he lives in uh, the North. Let me ex see exactly when. So he is a free man. Uh, no one is really sure if he is born free or he gains his freedom. He is working for Massachusetts Governor Christopher Gore um, when he writes this book, excuse me. Um, and it is recipes, but also recipes for like how to black boots or how to polish silver. And also it talks about how to run a household and how to run a household with domestic workers in it. Because the further we get into the 19th century, there are less big households um, with uh, another servant in charge of everybody. And more and more, it's the wife and mother who is running, uh, directing the servants if they have any. Uh, the second cookbook written by a Black American is uh, this one, a domestic cookbook, 1866, written by name Melinda Russell. So she's writing after the Civil War. She's born and raised in Tennessee, and she moves to Michigan and is living there as a free woman, obviously. It is a book that largely focuses on baking, as you can see from the page on the right. You will see in general books for women are much more about baking recipes, which are more surprise than, uh, precise than cooking recipes. Um, but again, with something like Dover cake, it just says two cups of sugar, four eggs, one cup of butter, one cup of sour cream, three cups of unsifted flour, one teaspoon of cream tartar, one teaspoon of soda, flavor to taste. Still pretty sparse recipes. Uh, not there's There are measurements in this one compared to the cuneiform, 5,000 year old cuneiform recipe but not a whole lot else. Um, she publishes it as selling this cookbook because she wants to raise money to go back to Tennessee. She decided she didn't like Michigan and she wanted to be close to her family again. And what is really wonderful about it is that she writes an introduction. So we have her own words and voice as a free black woman in the 19th century, which is very rare. And she credits her uh, culinary inspirations. So whereas a lot of cookbooks from the South in the 19th century certainly contain the recipes of Black cooks, we don't get to hear their voice or how they learn to cook. Um, Melinda Russell mentions the Virginia housewife, by Mary Randolph, a cookbook written by a white woman, but certainly pulling in many recipes by Black cooks. But she also talks about how she cooked under uh, in a household a woman named Fanny Stewart, uh, another Black cook who at the time was enslaved. Um, and so it's just so rare we get this clear attribution in history. Um, she also includes recipes for alcohol too. So it's interesting that that's another theme that goes way back through all of these cookbooks. The earliest Jewish cookbook comes from 1846, significant because in the Jewish way of cooking, you have to have kosher law. And many of these cookbooks come uh, from 
it, for example, the one written in 1846 was published in London. Um, it, she was a British Ashkenazic woman who married, uh, her husband came from an old Sephardic or Jewish like of Spain family that also lived in London. So this contains not only some of the first Ashkenazic written recipes, but also the first Sephardic written recipes, which carry a, that heavy Spanish influence. And she definitely addresses what it is like. She says like, you can still in entertain Gentiles, like they'll like this food. This food is really fashionable while it's kosher as well. And since it is sort of a Jewish manual edited by a lady, we do know her name now, Lady Judith Montefiore. Um, she also, in, in the second half of the book, it's again like home advice. She includes what she calls an old Roman recipe for improving the skin, which, call, which requires half a pint of fresh ass's milk to make it, and a lip balm recipe that requires spermaceti, a substance harvested from the skull of a sperm whale, which was also a popular material to make candles out of because it was waxy and burned very clear. I've made a couple recipes from her book too. This is a soup mieg, which I thought was very interesting because soup mieg literally translates to a meager soup, meaning that it's meatless. And this is actually a Christian Lenten recipe that uses really early spring vegetables, or in the case of this one, carrots are in there too, and celery because they are sort of uh, overwintering vegetables as well. You might have in your root cellar, celery might still be in the field, as well as things like fresh greens. Um, and I thought this was interesting because it makes sense that this was co-opted from Christian culture because um, since it's an entirely vegetable-based dish, it also abides by kosher law. You can eat it with meat or you can eat it uh, in a dairy meal without it violating kosher. Um, but my favorite dish was these. Uh, these are a, one of the Sephardic recipes and they are flaky pastry, egg and coconut tarts. And they were very good. I have a sweet tooth. So the recipes are well worth making. The first uh, Jewish recipe book printed in America was Jewish cookery book. This comes out in the 1870s, written by a woman who comes with the massive German immigration in the mid 19th century, which was not entirely Jewish. It was also Lutheran and Catholic. Um, I have made some good recipes from her, but this is a Passover recipe and it's a friendly for Passover recipe for a very famous dessert at that time called Charlotte Russe which again, she emphasizes this idea of like, you can keep kosher, but be a fashionable American too, and have fashionable things like Charlotte Russe. But to be honest, this recipe was not the best. Not the best, there's, there's better ones in there. As we get into the late 19th, early 20th century, this is when we see the first cookbooks written in America in different languages, including Yiddish, but I didn't include that one. This is the first Spanish language cookbook that comes from, uh, it's published in San Francisco. It was largely written in Southern California. Um, it is an amazing look at the cuisine of early California and um, written in Spanish, features mainly Mexican, Spanish, and Basque ingredients as well, and very local ingredients like barrel cactus fruit, which I'd forgotten about, and now I live in Las Vegas, so I really wanna find some barrel cactus fruit and try out some of the recipes in here. There's also some fairly early recipes for chili in here too, although not the earliest mention of chili. Um, in 1914 is the Chinese Japanese cookbook um, written by a, a Japanese woman and an American woman and um, includes recipes from both Chinese and Japanese culture written in English. And I also mentioned Cook at Home in Chinese, which is the first book um, written by a Chinese American man about authentic Chinese cooking, but for an American audience. So you see one in the 19 teens when there's actually quite a large Japanese immigration. And although uh, Japanese immigrants had been coming for quite a long time, uh, we don't see Henry Lowe's book published until 1938. Also, not only does it have dishes for uh, very accurate dishes from different provinces of China, there are also there's also a recipe in there for chop suey. So also the Chinese dishes that were created here in America. The Jewish manual is available online. You know what I will do, Jess? I actually have a handout with links to all of these, um, all of these books.
both online and if you can buy them in print, a link to that too. So I'll send that out to Jess and she will post it or send it in whatever way you can make it available. Yep, I'll send it out. I'll send it to her right after this talk. And so anything that has sort of grabbed your attention will be on this handout. Um, I also see I have a question in the Q&A. Do I know what the earliest cookbook recipes would in introduce the Mediterranean diet to America? Great question. Give me one minute to think. So in the Virginia uh, housewife, there are actually some Spanish influence recipes because we are, she is, that cookbook really encompasses a lot of Southern cuisine, including Florida and the Caribbean. The one that jumps to mind, uh, I know you're asking Mediterranean, but yeah, uh, is gazpacho. There's a, the earliest recipe for gazpacho in there. Really some of the earliest recipes uh, in English for tomatoes are in that book as well. Um, I also know that also in the 19 teens, there is a book called the Oriental Cookbook. And keep in mind the Orient in the early 20th century to America meant uh, West Africa to Japan, which is a huge swath of people and cultures. And that book talks a lot about, um, oh, I used it when I was studying Sephardic Jewish immigrants from Greece. So it talks about like Greece and Turkey primarily. And so that is where are, are described a lot of the seasonings and ingredients. And it was written in English. And the back of the book was really cool because it even told, it was like, dear readers, it, it was for a broad American audience, right? I think it was in a way to help new immigrants, but it was a little bit to, I think, create empathy and introduce this new cuisine and culture. Um, so it even told you, uh, it was based out of New York City, and it told you where in New York to go get some of these ingredients. Um, and it's things like phyllo dough, I remember is mentioned in there. Um, really, I'm digging in here. But the Oriental Cookbook is what it's called, and it was published in the 19 teens, I think 1911, or close to there. Um, and a great resource for a lot of these is the, it's called the Feeding America Project, and it's from Michigan State University. Um, they contain a, a scanned and searchable copies of a lot of these books. A lot of these are available on Google Books as well, and a lot of them are available on Project Gutenberg. Really had to dig in the files. That's always closing my mind, mental files. Um, so Project Gutenberg, the Feeding America Project from Michigan State University, and then of course, books.google.com has many of these too. So this is, it's not until the turn of the 20th century that we really see the format of these recipes change. Um, Fanny Farmer is known as the queen of level measurement. She's in this photo on the left. She's holding a measuring cup. Cooking schools begin popping up at the turn of the 20th century for two purposes. One, uh, many want to educate the massive waves of new immigrants in the American way of cooking. Some cooking schools are more understanding, largely the ones run by settlement houses, which were sort of like immigration education and community house hubs. And they kind of said they just want to promote a balanced diet, but they want to do that using the recipes of different nations. Um, the other reason the cooking schools popped up was because this is the time when less people have access to domestic labor. And so there is this push for um, mothers and wives to be able to cook as though they have servants when they don't. So Fanny Farmer, the head of the Boston Cooking School, probably the most famous cooking school of this era, is not the first person to standardize recipes in the way that we're used to, where you've got the ingredients at on top, and then all of the instructions are in the order of which they are, which you're supposed to do them, which doesn't seem like a tall order, but it definitely, we haven't really seen a lot of uh, recipes like that up until this point. And she is also the one that really emphasizes level measurements as opposed to some of the earlier ones where it's like a dash or butter the size of a walnut or two cents worth of cloves, um, recipes that can often make it really hard to recreate them today. And she is the one that decided to print recipes by volume as opposed to by weight. At this time, it was pretty uncommon. She just felt that it was, it was inexpensive and um, too big of an ask for the average American to have a scale in their kitchen but it was very easy for them to have a measuring cup in their kitchen. So she is the reason that in America, our recipes are by volume, whereas European cookbooks do it by weight. So she and her cookbook has sold millions of copies. It is still in print to this day. There, were, there are many, many, many different editions of it. 
And um, she really influenced how recipes are published to this day. But we do see interesting ways of pulling away from this traditional recipe outline. I sort of revisited Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And um, uh, Fanny Farmer also introduced this idea of cookbook writer as teacher too. So we've kind of moved away from cookbook writer as fancy or as medicine. And this is more about, I'm gonna teach you how to cook, in this case, the cuisine of, um, uh, of France. And one of the most fascinating things that she does, oh shoot, you know, I, I should have pulled a better recipe, but okay, she's got what we call the head note, she introduces the recipe, tells you how many people it's going to serve, she even offers you wine pairings, um, but what she will do in her books is that she will put, in this case, the ingredients just before the step that you need them in, as well as the equipment that you need, and in another one of her books, she actually lays that out along the sides, so like the instructions are here, but what ingredients and equipment you need is kind of happening parallel along the side. I think that's a really interesting way of visually organizing this book that we don't see very often today. And there are also writers from the 20th century that totally broke from um, our typical recipe writing. This is MFK Fisher from her book, How to Cook a Wolf. Um, and Fisher, uh, she writes like she is in the kitchen with you. Um, we're having a conversation. For sausage or sardine pie, spread sausage or bacon or fish thin in a pie pan or shallow casserole. Let heat in a quick oven and pour off almost all fat. Leave oil on sardines. Make one half usual baking powder biscuit, mis mixing with tomato sauce or meat stock. It is a question of flavors. One good combination with bacon strips is milk in the biscuit mix plus a generous half cup of grated cheese instead of milk or water. Add the onion and any chopped herbs you like, pour over the sausage and bake in an oven until firm and brown, about 20 minutes. So very like shatty kind of recipe. I also love the moosewood cookbook from 1977. I love the graphics of it in that it's all handwritten. Um, but it's also like, this is a summer vegetable soup. We don't need an exact recipe for this. Um, they give you other possibilities of things that you can throw in here. Um, she says it's about 40 minutes to prepare depending on your chopping speed. It'll be four to five servings depending on how hungry you are. I love this. I do want to give a nod to activism cookbooks as well. I'm thinking of developing a whole talk on this because it goes, activism cookbooks go all the way back to abolition and perhaps before. But this is a particularly significant one, the People's Philadelphia Cookbook from 1976. Um, this is, hang on, let me get the name right of the organization that put this together. Mm -hmm. Shefferidge, give me a second. So they are an organization out of, okay, whew, finally. So it was piled and published by the People's Fund, a grassroots organization founded in 1971. This is a very civil rights era. It is a time when there is hope for the things are going to change. They have, but certainly slowly. And the People's Fund was basically, it took money in from donors and it helped fund people's organizations like the United Farm Workers, so like unions, the Gay Activist Alliance of Philadelphia, so LGBTQ causes. And then the Black Panther Party also applied for funding and they were like, whoa, should we? They're controversial. And then they said, you know what, if we don't, that's kind of racist. And that's saying that these other funds are more valuable than the um, ideals of Black Philadelphians. And so this cookbook brings in recipes from all the different community organizations that they funded. So, and there are recipes, um, there's one from a gay activist called a very gay meatloaf, which I think is very funny. Um, and it was, it was, the very gay meatloaf was developed from recipes by two queer culinary icons, Alice B. Toklas and Craig Claiborne. Um, there is another recipe called resistance print shop sandwiches. And the head note reads, during the crucial years of 1973 to 1974, these sandwiches kept us going at the shop. They aren't extravagant, but they are tasty. It's a reflection of East Coast culture. Um, I know, I want to I wanna eat all of, all of these things, right? That there's even a recipe for sofrito as well. So you have Puerto Rican activists also um, adding recipes as well. 
One of the things I'm not gonna to touch in today, here's um, examples from the inside of the book, are cookbooks uh, that have to do with incarceration. Um, both hostages, hostage situation, POWs and incarceration, their own form of activism as well. Um, there are cookbooks that were written by formerly incarcerated men and women in America about the recipes, the comfort foods that they would make from the foods that they could find at the commissary too. So let's close out with a little bit about today. Um, I just wanna say too that the first recipe on the internet um, was published in, hang on, I'm gonna give you the exact date. So basically bulletin boards were the first websites that might include recipes. And these were not dedicated to recipes, they're more for families or professional occasions in the early 1990s. But it's thought that that is where the first recipes began to appear. Uh, a website called Global Gourmet launched September 1st, 1994, and they claim to be the first recipe website, but allrecipes.com, which I've used many times, has been around since 1995. So it's one of, it is in itself one of the most um, significant repositories of recipes in human history, um, since it has been collecting recipes online, largely family recipes for over 30 years now. Cookbooks today also still stand the gamut. We have something like The Food Lab by J. Kenji Lopez-Alt. He is really a food scientist, um, a food investigator too. He wants to think of, he challenges the idea of why we do something, not just because, but is this the best way to do it? And he also unpacks those best ways to do it. We do it this way because it creates the best caramelization. It does this or this or this. Everything about the recipes are extremely precise. And quite the other end of the spectrum, but one of my favorite cookbooks right now is also Indianish, And it's this very relaxed cookbook uh, that, that um, I just forgot her name. I'm going to go back and look at it. Priya Krishna, formerly Bon Appetit, now at the New York Times. She and her mom learned this book. And it is sort of about their lives cooking Indian food in America, but also how they eat as American citizens and as travelers of the world. And her recipes um, are both very clear, but very relaxed. She offers substitutions. She explains ingredients. She says, if you don't like this, do this. There's an ingredient that I tried, uh, asafetida, which is another tree sap um, that she says them when she includes in her recipes, not necessary, but really good. And it sort of gave me the confidence to be like, okay, I'll try it. I've never used this ingredient before. And it really is quite an amazing and delicious book. So that in brief, oh my gosh, <laughs> with three minutes to spare is my brief history of cookbooks. Um, do you have questions? I will also once again, drop the links to my book, Not a Cookbook Does Include Recipes, which is coming out in October. And I will definitely be talking to you about that before it comes out as well. Hang on. Putting it in. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, was, my pleasure. That was really fun. Um, a lot of information to get out, but stuff that I find was. so fascinating. And I will send out those links to you if you can hopefully disperse them or put them in a place where people can access them. Absolutely. Yeah, if you can. Um, I think I tried to look for those links, uh, the links that you that were on the web anyway. Um, <clears throat> I shared them to the chat, which I will save and share with um, all of the other people. But, um, but yeah, that was amazing. And Thank I'm you. really excited for your next talk. And you already came up with two brand new talks <laughs> like over the course of that whole thing. So that's amazing. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Um, I don't see that we have, uh, I don't have any, okay. We go. Just praises. And Mary, that is amazing too. My my contemporary cookbook shelf is pretty slender because I tend to cook for something for a while and then pass it on and then put a new one in too. This was this was recorded, right, Jess? It it is. It's still recording and it will be available tomorrow. So I'm going to send this out tomorrow with um reminders about your next your next programs. Fun. Well, Any thank you so much for hosting anyone? me. Yeah, we love you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and we can't wait for the next one. And um, yeah, again, I will send this out to everyone. Um, 
Do you do, I do Zooms? Zooms all over the country? I do. I, I think that's such a, I love the way you put that because of course I am in my bedroom, but yes, I do talks all over the country and then come the fall too, I'll also be on a book tour as well. So hopefully I will be in a city near you. I've already started posting some dates on my website and probably along with the tour to different bookshops, I'll probably also be booking in-person lectures across the country as well. That would be fantastic. I hope you can visit us. I hope All right. so too. Um, well, thank you so much, Sarah, and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you next month. Bye.